Hi. That snow outside is awful, right? I can't t take the sun. I mean, I, I, that was must have been one of the worst calls in history to call off school for today. But I, I've heard it's not NYU's fault. It's actually the New York City's rules on public schools that apply. So New York City was stupid and NYU followed. So that's out of the way. Let's let's get back to business. I mean, I know we can't meet physically, but there's no reason why I can't get through the material I was planning to anyway. Uh, so today I want to complete my our discussion of growth and turn to a number that scares a lot of people in discounted cash flow evaluation. It's that terminal value, that closure number. I want to talk about the rules that you need to follow in estimating the terminal value and what keeps it in check. But let me start with growth. Last session I talked about estimating growth using fundamentals, right? I mean, you look at reinvestment rate times and how much you reinvest and how well you reinvest. And the product of those two numbers, I said, gives you the growth rate. That equation is a very powerful one where I multiply the retention ratio by the return on equity to get the growth in earnings per share or the equity reinvestment rate by the return on equity to get the growth in free cash or equity. It's powerful enough that sometimes we lose our senses because we get so focused on how neat the equation is that we don't try to think about what we need to assume for it to fit. Those fundamental growth equations will give you your expected growth rate if you're in steady state. What does that mean? If your return on capital is stable and your reinvestment rate is stable, then taking the product of those two will give you the growth rate. But for your return on capital to be stable, your margins have to have settled down. And for many companies, returns on capital and margins remain in transition, either young companies or older companies can expect margins and returns on capital to change. So first I want to focus on what happens when you expect your return on capital to change and then talk a little bit more about a more general way of estimating growth. So let's assume that the return on capital in period T is ROC with the, sub, uh, sub, uh, the subscript of T and return on capital in T plus 1 is the return on capital in the following period. Now, if you have no change, in the, if the return capitals are equal in both periods, then the growth rate becomes the fundamental growth rate, return on capital times reinvestment rate. But if the return on capital next period is expected to be different from this one, there's going to be an effect on growth. Think of why. Let's assume you have a company with a 5% return on capital, no reinvestment, and it expects its return on capital to be 6% next year. Remember that no reinvestment means the reinvestment rate is zero. So if you're using the reinvestment rate equation, there's no growth next year. But if your return on capital goes from 5% to 6%, that's a 20% growth in income. The change in the return on capital becomes a growth rate in the year in which it happens. So if return on capital goes up, it's going to make your growth rate higher than your fundamental growth rate. If your return on capital is decreasing, it'll make your growth rate lower than your fundamental growth rate. Let's try this out. This is about 20 years ago, I was valuing Motorola, and its return on capital was about 12%, and its reinvestment rate was about 53%. If I just stopped there and took the product of those two numbers, I get about a 6% growth rate. Not bad, but let's assume that I told you that Motorola is on its way back, that its return on capital is going to rise from 12.18% to 17.22%, not immediately, but over the next five years. Let's see what effect this is going to have on growth. Let's also assume that the new projects that Motorola takes over the next five years, starting right away, will be at 17 point. So the existing pro assets that Motorola has will see an improvement in return on capital from 12.18 to 17.22. The new projects, it'll go, it's going to earn 17.22% right from the beginning. Its reinvestment rate stays, let's assume, at 52.99%. Its expected growth rate from new investments will then be the 17.22% that I expect to make on new investments times the 52.99%, right? That's about 8.5%, 9% growth rate. Not bad, right? But look at the second term of the equation. You're saying, what the hell are you doing? I'm taking the change in the return on capital, which is about 5% over five years, and I'm spreading it out over the five years because it's not all happening right away. It looks complicated, but I'm just looking at the compounded effect. If you're in a hurry, you can just take the change and divide by five if you want. But that extra growth rate that I'm going to get because my return on capital is improving from 12 to 17 percent will make my growth rate 16.3 percent. That's almost doubling my growth rate because I'm bringing in the change in the return on capital.
So if you break it down, it turns out that the growth from new investments for Motorola will be the 9.12%, the return capital times reinvestment rate. But the change in my return on capital is creating another 7% in growth. So it makes you think about return on capital in a much more dynamic way. Your returns on capital in existing assets reflecting past investments, returns on capital in new assets reflecting new projects, and those two numbers can evolve and change over time. And when that happens, you can't just use this simple equation, return on capital times reinvestment rate, to get a growth rate. So let's do a test. Let's suppose I came to you with five companies. They all have the same expected growth rate, okay? and they get there in very different ways. The first company has a 20% reinvestment rate and a 50% return on capital. And there's, there's no change in the return on capital, so you can just take the growth rate as a given. The second company has a 100% reinvestment rate and a 10% return on capital. Again, no change in return on capital. The third firm has a 200% reinvestment rate and a 5% return on capital. No change in the return on capital. The fourth firm has a 20% reinvestment rate and a 10% return on capital, but next year it expects its return on capital to go from 10 to 10.8%. It, too, will have a 10% growth rate because it will get that oomph growth, that gro growth coming from the fact that you're improving return on capital. And the fifth firm has no reinvestment but just improves the return on capital. As an investor, I want you to rank these firms from worst firm, from most value added to least value added. Which of these five firms over the long term is going to have the most value added? Think about it. They all have the same observed growth rate. But growth is not made equal. The company with the most valuable growth rate is firm one. Why? Because it gets 10% growth with very little reinvestment and a huge return on capital. Yeah. Close behind it will be firm five, even though it's only for one year. And here's why. Firm five has an improvement in the return cap from 10 to 11%. It's pure gravy. It does it with no reinvestment. So firm one, firm five. I put firm four right behind firm five. So firm one, firm five, firm four. Firm four also gets an improvement and that adds growth. Again, it's only one year, but it, you'll take one year over nothing. You say, what about firms two and three? Firm two, and, firm two has a return on capital of 10%, but since its cost of capital is also 10%, it's basically running in place. It's growing, but it's not creating any value. And firm three is doing the worst of all things. It's growing but it's growing the wrong way. It's growing by taking projects that earn less than the cost of capital. So let me summarize. Firm one, best firm, long-term value added, taking great projects. Firm five, not long-term value, but at least it's pure icing for next year. Firm four, mostly icing for next year. Firm two, running in place, and at the bottom of the list is firm three, because it's actually destroying value as it grows. Try this out on a sector. Take companies, all of which have high growth, and then start ranking the growth rates based on where the growth comes from whether it's coming from new great investments, whether it's come from improving existing investments, whether it's by taking investments that earn less than the cost of capital or roughly the cost of capital, not all growth is created equal. So now let's complete the growth story by bringing in the final way of thinking about growth. And this is the most generic way of thinking about growth. When you have a company whose margins are changing, and this is more the rule than the exception, this is the process I use for 80% of companies, you cannot start with operating income and work from there because it's too messy. you got to start with revenues. It's called top-down estimate for that reason. So you have to start with revenues and you pro project out future growth and revenues. In doing so, you got to factor in what total market they're going after, what their market share is going to be. In a sense, you got to tell a story about the company that tells you how their revenues will go over time. Second, you got to estimate a margin for the company over time, starting with the margin today, which might be a low or a negative number, and moving towards a target margin. It could cut the other way as well. Your company might have really high margins now. You expect the margins to decrease over time, but you have to estimate the margins over time. So your revenues first, your margins next. Revenues times margins gives you your operating income, and the operating income can be netted off taxes to get the after-tax operating income. To estimate reinvestment, here's what I suggest you do. Rather than break into capex and depreciation and working capital and look at the past, remember this is top down, so everything is being driven by a forecast of revenues. You want to tie your reinvestment to what's happening to your revenues. So if you have high growth in revenues, you need high reinvestment. To do this, I'm going to create a ratio, concoct a ratio, where I'm going to take revenues and divide it by invested capital. What does it tell me? It tells me how efficiently I generate revenues. If this number is high, I generate a lot of revenues for very little capital invested. If this number is low, I'm much more capital intensive. 
So if I have a sales to capital, and that's the sales to capital ratio of two, here's what I do. If my revenues increase by 200 million in, next, in the next year, I set aside 100 million into reinvestment to get that 200 million. So every year I take the change in revenues and use the sales to capital ratio to estimate how much I will reinvest. Because it all comes out of cash flows anyway, I really don't care about whether I reinvest in acquisitions, R&D, working capital, whatever else. Ultimately, it gets taken out of your after-tax operating income to get to cash flows. So let me give you an example. One of my favorite companies to analyze is Tesla. And this was a valuation I did in July of 2015 when Tesla had revenues of about $2 billion and was losing about $21.8 billion. It had an operating loss of $21.8 billion. Its operating margin was minus 1%. So to value Tesla, I first had to make it bigger. And the way I made it bigger is I focused on revenues. And I had a story about what I thought Tesla would become as a company, more of a luxury automobile company that becomes pretty successful. It's, uh, it's revenues by the, time of, by the time I projected our 10 years would have been much larger than Audi. Or Vo- In fact, it would have made it a pretty large automobile company, not Volkswagen-like, because that's mass market auto. So I gave them revenues of about $79.5 billion. So the revenue growth numbers that I use basically reflect my desire to make the company bigger. You're saying, why 65% for the first five years? Don't focus. The way I I back into this is I think about my end revenues first, what I'd like to see in year 10 based on my story for the company. And my revenue growth is just a way of getting there. So the 65% growth for the next five years, and then I start to scale it down because the company is getting really big, reflects my desire to get to a $79.5 billion. If I wanted to make Tesla a $150 billion company, because that's what my story would expect me, I would use a much higher growth rate, 80% of 65%, and your end revenues would be much higher. But I have to fix another problem. As the operating margin stays at minus 1.08%, Tesla will cease to exist. So over time, I tell a story about what I think this margin will be. And the margin I give them is at the 75th percentile of high-end automobile companies. I treat them as a luxury auto company, and I give them margins closer to the luxury auto business and give them a 12% margin. Again, I don't expect miracles. I don't expect the margin to become 12% overnight but I gradually go from where I am today. You're saying, how do I get from minus 1.08 to 12%? You can make your journey. You can take linear steps, basically divide by tw- take the difference, divide by 12. I actually have lots of different proxies, and we'll talk about more of these later. But again, it's got to be tied to a story. If your story is about massively improving margins up front, then you'll uh, you know front-end the improvement, but at the end of the game, you're going to get 12% margins. You're saying, where is this going to lead me? My small revenues become big revenues. As my margin goes from negative to positive, my losses become profits. By the time I get to year 10, based on my story, Tesla's operating income will be $9.5 billion. But essentially, you can see the process by which I've built from revenues to margins to is essentially is the process that I would use to build up my entire valuation. Now, let's complete the last loose end. I've got to figure out reinvestment. To estimate the reinvestment, I used a sales to capital ratio 1.35. Essentially, I assumed that Tesla would continue to reinvest at the rate it has historically. I'm sorry, 1.55, which means for every $1.55 in additional revenues, I've got to invest a dollar in invested capital. So here's how I do it. I take the change in revenues every year, which I get from using my growth rate. So in year one, for instance, my revenues go from $2 billion to $3.3 billion. I take the $1.3 billion increase in revenues, divide by 1.55, I get a reinvestment of $844 million. You get this? Very simple. I take the change in revenues, divide by 145, I get the reinvestment every year. That reinvestment is what I subtract out of after-tax operating income to get to my free cash flow to the firm. This is a pretty optimistic story, but look at what my free cash flows look like in this story. They're negative for the first nine years. This is a cash-burning machine, but it's because I'm so optimistic about the company. Sounds like a strange thing to say, but because I'm optimistic in using such high growth rates, the assembly lines they will have to build to get to a $79 billion revenues will make their free cash flow to the firm negative. Now, one interesting thing when you do these top-down valuations is you can sometimes lose track of hey, what kind of profitability am I assuming about this company? So here's a simple way to keep a check on whether your assumptions are reasonable or not. One way to think about reinvestment. 
is that every time you reinvest back, you're increasing your invested capital. That's always the case, but we tend to forget about that in traditional valuation. So in this case, here's what I did. I started with the existing invested capital at Tesla of $1.045 billion, and every time they reinvested, I added that reinvestment onto the invested capital. And as you can see, over time, invested capital, which starts at a billion, ends at $51 billion. You're saying, so what? If I take my after-tax operating income that I have in year 10 and divide by my invested capital in year 10, I get a return invested capital of about 12.15%. The question I have to ask myself is, am I comfortable with that return on capital? And I was. That's higher than the cost of capital, but I think Tesla is a special company. It has competitive advantages and barriers to entry. That return on capital of 12% seems reasonable to me. You're saying, what would not have been reasonable? If my return on capital in year 10 had been 121%, that's too high a number. You're saying, what are you going to do about it? If that number is too high, I'm not reinvesting enough. If I'm not reinvesting enough, there's a simple fix. I lower my sales to capital ratio until my invested capital climbs to a point where I'm comfortable. So this is a feedback loop that you need to use. When you do evaluation, don't just sit and stare at the numbers and let them go by. Think about the company you create and ask yourself, am I comfortable with the company I've created? So let's review the steps. When the margin changes, you've got to start with revenues and project out future revenues. That's not easy to do, but it needs a story that you're telling about your company, the market it's going after, and the revenues. The second step in the process is you have to take the operating margin, which right now might be a negative number, and project out what it'll look like once the company gets to steady state. Again, I'm not suggesting this is going to be easy, but you've got to pick your target and move towards it. Third step, you've got to estimate how much you're going to reinvest, and you're going to tie that reinvestment to your revenues because that's really the only number of substance here. And that reinvestment is what you subtract out to get to firm, the free cash flow of the firm. The final step is to check your own numbers by computing this imputed return on capital based on your own projections. Ask yourself, am I comfortable? Two final loose ends here, and I'll come back and talk more about these. One is, if you look at the first year when Tesla starts to make an operating profit, Notice they don't, make, they don't pay any taxes. In year two, again, they don't pay any taxes. Year three, they start to pay, but a very little, amount, a small amount. You're saying, how come? Because they had a net operating loss carried into the base year, and that net operating loss is going to shelter their taxes going forward. So I'm projecting earnings for Tesla very early, but I'm also projecting negative cash flows as they grow. So this is a process we'll re return to as we go into more detailed valuations. But my valuation of the week for this week, I think is going to be lift. If I get a chance, I'm going to value it this evening. And you're going to see this process play out. And I'd strongly encourage you, I know the quiz is Wednesday, you're not going to do it before Wednesday, after Wednesday, to pick up lift and work through the numbers so that you get more comfortable with this process. It's the most flexible way of estimating free cash flow of the firm. You can use it on any kind of firm, from mature to young growth, from declining to startup. So it's a very, very, it's a very, it's a, it's a way that you can bend to whatever your needs are. So let's summarize the different ways of thinking about growth. First, you have to decide whether your growth is an equity income or operating income because they're different. If it's equity income, you have to ask yourself, do I want to trust analysts and use their growth rates, in which case you're using an earnings per share growth. You can use a historical growth, which might or might not work. It really depends on your company, but most of the cases, I think it's going to give you a bad estimate. Or you can use fundamentals. If it's fundamentals, you can focus on earnings per share, in which case you look at retention ratio, the percentage of earnings you put back into the firm uh, you know, that you don't pay out as dividends times the retention times the return equity, but that's only if you have stable return equity. And if you have changing return equity, you've got to bring in that return equity effect. With operating income, you can either use historical again, and again with all the caveats that I gave you about equity earnings or historical income growth, or you can use fundamentals. If it's stable return on capital, you can use return on capital times reinvestment rate. If it's not stable, then you might have to add that additional component for the improvement in return capital. Or more generally, if you have negative earnings and your margins are changing, go through the longer approach. Start with revenues, project out margins, project out reinvestment. The end game is still free cash, uh, free cash flows in all of these approaches. But the way you get there is going to be different. Which brings me to the fourth and final. So we've talked about discount rates, cash flows, growth rates. Let's, let's put closure. And I, and I use the word intentionally. One of the problems with valuing a publicly traded company is that the cash flows could go on forever. And because in theory, a publicly traded company can last forever. We cannot estimate cash flows forever. 
That's why in a discounted cash flow valuation, we're looking for closure. And the way we put closure is we stop estimating cash flows at some point in time, year five, year 10, and we estimate a terminal value. That terminal value captures what we think this company will be worth at the end of year five or year 10, and it allows us to stop estimating cash flows without ignoring what happens after year five or 10. The question then is, how do we estimate terminal value? There are three approaches that can be used, and one of them should never be used, but it's the most frequently used. The first approach, which is the most conservative approach, is to estimate a liquidation value. Basically, you end your company in year 10, and you sell off your assets for scrap. In fact, in capital budgeting, that's often how we put closure on a capital budgeting project. And we do that with a public company. We're effectively cutting off its earning power. It's conservative because for most companies, what they will be worth is going concerns will be worth is more than what you would get by liquidating them. But if I had a real estate company or a private company where the owner is essentially the only thing keeping the company alive, I might use this approach of a liquidation value. So that, that approach is perfectly appropriate. It's a cash flow based approach, but it's a conservative approach. The other cash flow based approach is assume that after year five or 10, your cash flows will continue to grow forever at a constant growth rate. And that constant growth rate buys you in mathematics an infinite series. And that infinite series can be captured with one equation, a terminal value equation. I'm going to come back and spend a lot of time at that because that is conventionally an intrinsic valuation the way you wrap up loose ends. In 80% of all valuations out there, and almost every banking valuation, you know how the terminal value is computed? It's not by using a stable growth model. It's not a liquidation valuation. It's by applying a multiple. Multiple to your 5 or 10. Multiple of what? You pick it. EBITDA, EBIT, revenues. And where do the multiple come from? From looking at other companies in the peer group. So other companies in the peer group traded 10 times EBITDA. I'm going to apply it on my EBITDA in year 10. If you do this, please, please, please don't call this a discounted cash flow valuation or an intrinsic valuation. It's a pricing because your biggest number here comes from a pricing, from applying a multiple to it. If you do that, just call it what it is. It's a forward pricing with a front end of cash flows. Nothing wrong with it, but be honest about what you're doing. So if you see somebody doing a discounted cash flow valuation, they're applying a multiple to get the terminal value, point out to them that this is not intrinsic valuation. It's a pricing masquerading as an intrinsic valuation. So let me focus on the stable growth model, because ultimately, if you're doing intrinsic valuation, it's really a question of liquidation value or the stable growth model. And if you have any kind of going concern, the stable growth model is a more sensible model. If you look at the equation for the stable growth model, which, as I said, we stole from mathematics as an infinite series, this is what it works out to. To get the value in year n, I get the expected cash flow in year n plus 1. So let me be specific. To get the terminal value in year 10, I need the expected cash flow in year 11, and I divide by the difference between the discount rate and the growth rate. This is perhaps the most dangerous equation in valuation. And you can see why, right? Take a look at the denominator. If you sit there and play with the growth rate, and that's exactly the word that I would use, play with the growth rate, where I keep pushing the growth rate up, you're going to very quickly see your growth rate converge on the discount rate and your terminal value is going to explode. Every analyst who wants to make his value go up knows exactly what to do. Go to the terminal value, play with the growth rate. And left to its own devices, your terminal value can destroy your discounted cash flow valuation. So I'm going to start off by laying down the law. If you're going to use a, a perpetual growth model, your growth rate cannot exceed the growth rate of the economy in which you operate. You can define that as your domestic economy, your global, the glo whatever it is, there's a math problem. If you let your company grow at a rate that is greater than the growth rate of the economy in which you operate, at some point in time, your company will become the economy. And then what? Rocket? You know, you're going to go to other planets. You can't. There, there's a limit here. So basically, the that cap, and I'm going to give you a very simple proxy for that cap, is the first rule. You got to make sure your growth rate in perpetuity is not what you think about the company today, but is capped by the growth rate of the economy. Incidentally, you can use a zero growth rate forever. Your company can have a flat growth. It can even have a negative growth rate forever. That sounds absurd, but if I put in a minus 3% growth rate every year after year 10, here's what I'm doing. I'm letting my company peak in year 10 and actually get smaller over time, which actually is more in line with what you see with corporate life cycles. 
It's only in discounted cash flow valuation that every company keeps growing and every company becomes a giant company. So I'm going to give you my proxy for this growth rate forever. I said it cannot exceed the growth rate of the economy. And remember, if you, uh, what we said earlier about currency consistency, if you're doing your cash flows in nominal terms, when I talk about the growth rate in the economy, I'm talking about a nominal growth rate in the economy. If you're doing things in real terms, it's a real growth rate in the economy. Let's stay with the nominal growth rate because that's what most of us use. And how the heck am I going to exceed the no uh, estimate the nominal growth rate in the economy? You can do the wasteful thing, which is to ask economists what, do you think, what they think the growth rate will be. Well, what do they know? Why do you waste your time? I'll give you the, pr the cap that works for me, the proxy that works for me. I use my risk-free rate as my proxy for the growth rate in the economy. I know a lot of people disagree with me on this, so let me explain my rationale. The risk-free rate, if you think about it ab in abstractions, is the expected inflation rate plus the expected real interest rate. The nominal growth rate in the economy is expected inflation plus an expected real growth rate. The real interest rate is what borrowers agree to return to lenders in the form of real goods and services. The real growth rate in the economy measures the growth rate in goods and services. Do you see where I'm going? In the long term, your real growth rate cannot be lower than the real interest rate. Because if the real growth rate is lower than the real interest rate, where the heck are you going to come up with the goods and services to deliver to those people who borrow. In the long term, it is possible it could be higher than the real interest rate, but not by much. As economies mature, those two numbers will converge. In fact, to back it up, let me show you some actual numbers. What I've done here is gone all the way back to 1954, and I have an updated version of this table on my website through 2018, and here's what I did. I looked at the average T-bond rate during the period. I looked at the inflation rate and real GDP growth rate during the period. If you add the inflation rate to the real GDP growth, you get, you get the nominal GDP growth rate. Let's take the entire time period. Between 1954 and 2015, the nominal GDP growth in the U.S. was about 6.7%. The T-bond rate was 5.9%. That's over the entire period. But if you fo focus on the period since 1981, the nominal T-bond rate and the nominal GDP growth have been pretty much the same number. This actually is why when we did the implied premium for the S&P 500, I used the risk-free rate as a growth. None of this is conclusive. I haven't proved that the risk-free rate is equal to the nominal growth rate of the economy. What I'm saying is I think that the two are very closely connected. And to make assumptions about the two that are at odds with each other, using a 4% nominal growth in an economy where the risk-free rate is 2%, in my view, is asking for trouble. So we are implicitly making assumptions about nominal growth when we use a risk-free rate, and we have to be consistent with that assumption. So if you're working with a Swiss company and valuing it in Swiss francs, guess what? You've been trapped into a low growth rate in perpetuity. The same forces that gave you that low discount rate will keep your growth rate low. So it keeps your valuations in sync, and basically it means be ex when you make explicit assumptions, tie that explicit assumption about nominal growth rate to the implicit assumptions you're making with the risk-free rate you're using. So that's my first route. Cap the growth rate, preferably at the risk-free rate. Second, one of the questions you always face with a company is when will I, because to make your company have a terminal value, you've got to assume a constant growth rate forever, which is effectively the characteristic of a mature company. You're saying, when, will, when should I make my company a mature company? I can't give you the answer because it depends on your company. But let's suppose I gave you a young, high-growth firm with a lot of growth, great potential just after its IPO. How long would you set the high growth? It's an abstraction. I haven't named the company. But just as general rule, how long do you think growth lasts at young, high-growth firms? Less than five years? Five years? Ten years? More than ten years? What do you think? I know many analysts pick more than ten years. Okay? So when you assume high growth for a long period, you say, hey, you know, my company can keep doing this for you know, 15, 20 years. The reality is much more pessimistic. It actually, and I'll show you a graph later in the slides, you will see this graph where I actually graph out, on average, how long growth actually lasts at a growth company. And you're going to be shocked. It's closer to 5 than to 15. But my only suggestion is when you think about how long growth will last at your company, don't be too optimistic. Don't say 25 years or 50 years. You think, but there have been companies that have grown for longer than 10 years. Absolutely, and we can name them, right? 
Microsoft, Google, IBM. I mean, the very fact that we can name these companies tells you what? That they're the exception rather than the rule. I, I'm, I don't value companies with a growth period that ever exceeds 10 years, ever. I'm not saying growth will not last more than 10 years, but if it lasts more than 10 years, I want it to be icing on the cake that I claim as an investor, not give it away by paying a higher price up front. And it's not just growth that matters, right? It's excess returns. You might be able to grow for a long period, but if you're not able to maintain excess returns, the value of that growth will dissipate. So just hold back on getting too optimistic about growth periods and tie what you assume about growth to your competitive advantages. In other words, if your young growth firm has very strong competitive advantages, you should feel much more comfortable allowing for a longer growth period. But if you feel your young growth firm's competitive advantages are minimal and that they will melt away quickly, you should be much more conservative about the growth period. I'll give you a, an example. When Groupon went public, people talked about how fast it was growing, how great was a company. And I took a look at it and said, what's its competitive advantage? I asked this of somebody who's a very strong advocate for Groupon. And he said, they have this email list of everybody that they can email the deals of the week. I said, that's your competitive advantage? You got my email before somebody else did? And they said, yes, it's a big advantage. And you saw how quickly that advantage dissipated. Living social media, Amazon deal of the day, it's almost overnight, it's competitive advantage dissipated. So think about when your company will be mature, not just in terms of growth rate, but in terms of excess returns. Third stop in the process. When you get to stable growth and you make your company a mature company, if you give it a growth rate, don't forget the rules we laid down during growth. In fact, those rules will kick in manifold. Remember the rule to grow, you got to reinvest that the growth rate is reinvestment rate times return on capital. And we allow for a growth rate from improved efficiency. In, in high growth, you can have growth rate from improved efficiency. So in other words, you, your grow, return on capital improves from 3% to 15%. You can have a really high growth rate for the next 5, 10 years. But once you get to stable growth and you say your company is going to keep doing whatever it's doing forever, you can't count on efficiency anymore because you can get only so efficient. So in stable growth, your growth rate has to be reinvestment rate times return on capital. Which means the algebra works out to be very simple. If you give me your growth rate in perpetuity and you tell me what kind of return on capital you will earn as a stable growth firm, I'll tell you how much you need to reinvest. It's your growth rate divided by return on capital. So if you want to grow at 3% a year and your return on capital is 10%, you will have to reinvest 30% of your after-tax operating income. So here's my full equation for the terminal value. Remember the original equation just said cash flow next year divided by R, R minus G. Here's the full version. To get my terminal value in year N, year N I'm going to start with the, R, with the operating income in year N plus 1. I'm going to multiply by 1 minus T. You're saying, why keep it separate? Because remember we talked about how you might want to move from an effective tax rate to a marginal tax rate? Because this is now your tax rate forever. I would move it towards a marginal tax rate. And for my... To get to my cash flows, I have to subtract out what I reinvest, and I will do that by looking at your growth rate and your return on capital. I'm going to divide by cost to capital minus the growth rate. This is the full form of the terminal value equation. Don't let the shortcut fool you. This is how we compute terminal value. And it actually leads to some very interesting dynamics. If you have a firm, so let's say well, you have, let's do some what ifs. You have a firm with an expected after-tax operating income of 100 million year end plus one and a cost of capital of 10 percent. What I have in this table are my estimates of terminal values as a function of two things: my growth rate forever and my return on capital in perpetuity. Let me take the most interesting case. Take the return on capital in perpetuity of 10 percent. That's exactly equal to my cost of capital, right? As I change my growth rate from zero percent. To 3%, take a look at what happens to my terminal value. Absolutely nothing. You say, how could that be? If I'm using a higher growth rate, why isn't my terminal value changing? Remember, as your growth changes, if you go back to the previous page, think of what else is changing, right? Your reinvestment is changing. And in the special case where your return on capital is equal to the cost of capital, whatever you gain by using a higher growth rate, you're going to lose by having higher reinvestment. Of course, if my return on capital is higher than my cost of capital, as I increase my growth rate, my terminal value increases, but not by astro astronomical amounts. And if my return on capital is lower than my growth rate, guess what? My terminal value will actually decrease as I make my growth increase. This is a perfect way to illustrate to somebody why growth is not always a good thing. 
In this case, it's a function of what your return on capital is relative to your cost of capital. So if your return on capital is equal to your cost of capital, growth does nothing. If it's higher than your cost of capital, growth will increase your terminal value, higher growth. If it's less than your cost of capital, higher growth will lower your cost of capital. I'm sorry, will lower your terminal value. People often say the biggest assumption you make in your terminal value assumption is the growth rate you use. That's not true. It's not the growth rate that drives your terminal value. It's what you're assuming about the return on capital in perpetuity. It's a lesson worth remembering because it's a lesson many analysts seem to forget. Incidentally, those that assumption about returns on capital being higher than the cost of capital, it, the McKinsey actually makes the assumption, and this is actually built into their discounted cash flow models for all their consultants, is once you become a mature company, your return on capital has to be equal to your cost of capital, which means growth ceases to exist. That's why in the McKinsey valuation book, the terminal value has no reinvestment. It's just after-tax operating income divided by the cost of capital. There's no growth and no reinvestment. Sounds strange, but if you assume return on capital is equal to the cost of capital, might as well do zero growth and zero reinvestment. But McKinsey itself presents evidence that suggests their assumption that mature companies earn the cost of capital might be a strong one. They've actually looked at what happens to growth over time and what happens to excess returns over time, excess returns being the difference between return on capital and cost of capital. They conclude that growth drops towards the growth rate of the economy pretty quickly, but excess returns stay elevated. So that's why I like to preserve the freedom, the discretion that for some companies, I might want to leave the return on capital above the cost of capital once I get to year 10, because 10 years is not enough for me to bring excess returns down to zero if I'm valuing a Facebook, an Apple, uh, Coca-Cola, companies with strong competitive advantages. And at this point, you have the ammunition to take apart analysts who do really stupid things. For instance, a typical assumption in many discounted cash flow valuations is we're looking at terminal value, looking at a mature company, and mature companies have capex equal to depreciation. I don't know where this assumption came from, but capex is assumed to offset depreciation. Net capex is zero, and there are no working capital requirements. Let's do the math. If net capex is zero, and there are no working capital reinvestments, you're basically having a reinvestment rate of zero, right? But you're told, hey, stable growth firms don't need to reinvest to grow. If you make this assumption of capex offsetting depreciation, no working capital requirements, what's the only growth rate that is consistent with that assumption? Think about it. Okay? Think about the equation. Reinvestment rate times return on capital is a growth rate. I've assumed a reinvestment rate of zero. The zero times table is magical, right? Zero times any number is zero. The only growth rate you can use if you assume net capex of zero and no working capital requirements is zero. Well, the pushback you get from some analysts is, what if I'm just assuming a growth rate equal to the inflation rate? Then I don't have to reinvest, right? Well, it's true. You don't have to increase your capital base, but you have to replace old machines with new machines, right, to keep the capital base going. And guess what? If you count on inflation pushing up your prices and your revenues and your earnings, how come that same inflation is not making that old machine more expensive when you replace it with a new machine? You can't selectively assume inflation where you like it and ignore it where you don't. There is no escape hatch here. If you want to grow, you need to reinvest. Perhaps if you're growing just at the inflation rate and you can replace old equipment with new equipment more efficiently, you might have a high return on capital, but you're never going to have an infinite return on capital. You cannot assume capex offsets depreciation and get away with it if you're also assuming a growth rate to go with it. Finally, you're making your company a mature company to estimate the terminal value, right? Be consistent. Give it the rest of the characteristics of a mature company. And what do I mean by this? As companies become mature, they tend to have betas. Their risk looks a lot more like the risk of an average company. If you're using betas, the beta should move towards one. If your company goes from being a young growth company to a mature company, I would expect it to be able to borrow more money. It might not use it, but it has more debt capacity. And if you're looking at a company that's growing in a risky country, as that country evolves, you might get the same phenomenon you have with companies, that risk premium for the country might decrease. In other words, when you compute cost of capital for a mature firm, that cost of capital almost always will be different from the cost of capital you have for the firm when you start the valuation. Same thing with return on capital. When you start the process, your return on capital might be way above the cost of capital because you have a young company in a niche market. As it grows and matures, I would expect the return on capital to move towards the cost of capital. 
your McKinsey, of course, it moves to the cost of capital, but I let it move it towards the cost. So right now, if I'm making a 30% return on capital, my cost of capital is 12%. When I get to be a mature firm, my cost of capital might drop to 8%. My return on capital will go from 30 down to 12 or 11 or 10%. And finally, make sure you reinvest. Even though you're a mature firm, you can't stop reinvesting. And use the fundamentals. And if you're doing an equity valuation then, you're going to compute how much you will need to reinvest by looking at your growth and your return equity. If you're doing a firm valuation, it'll be growth over return on capital. So essentially, it allows you to think about what you need to do to make your firm a mature firm. Okay, so let's see where we are right now. If you think about the inputs, we've talked about how to estimate discount rates and the currency of your choice, reflecting you know the risk of the company, neither the equity, the cost of equity, the cost of debt. Uh, we've talked about estimating cash flows. We've talked about growth rates. We've uh, we talked about coming up with terminal value. But in all of this, I gave you a choice at each stage of the process, right? Because you can value a firm by estimating the the, the cash flows to equity or cash flows of the firm, discount rates, cost of equity or cost of care, lots of choices along the way. So at this point, you're probably saying, well, which of those different choices works best for my company? How do I decide the right model to use for your company? So in this very short piece, I'd like to talk about how to pick the cash flow to discount when you're doing valuation, how to come up with the discount rate to apply in the cash flows, and which growth pattern fits best for your company. So let's start with the first of those questions. Which cash flow should I discount? Most of the time, I think you should just go with firm valuation. It's better to value the entire business than it is value equity because it's not only is it, um, is it more complete, but it allows you to change your mind on things like how much debt you have, changing your debt ratio over time. Equity valuation works best when you have a firm with stable leverage, whether it's high or low. If you can tell me that your firm is in steady state, it's at a 40% debt ratio, it plans to be at that 40% debt ratio, essentially for the long term, or if you cannot estimate cash flows to the firm. And we'll talk about the scenarios under which that's true. Firm valuation, though, is more general. You can apply it to firms where the leverage is changing, where you're partial in. I mean, in a sense, lots of different scenarios where equity valuation would not work. So let's talk about why equity valuation might work if you have stable leverage. Remember when we talked about estimating free cash flow equity? I, you might not, but go back and look at your notes. I gave you a shortcut for estimating free cash flow equity where instead of figuring out debt repayments and new debt issues, which is really tough to forecast going forward, I said you can multiply your reinvestment by one minus the debt ratio. That works though only if you have a stable debt ratio. So if you have a stable debt ratio, you can estimate free cash flow equity. And to the extent that you can estimate free cash flow equity, you can value it. The dividend discount model. I'm saying, why would anybody ever use that? Well, to estimate to use an alternative to the dividend discount model, I need to estimate free cash flow equity. If I cannot estimate free cash flow equity, and there are sectors where people give up, you're stuck with the dividend discount model. I don't want to be mysterious, but there's a reason why dividend discount models still have a foothold with banks, insurance companies, investment banks. Think of why. To estimate free cash flow equity, I need capex, depreciation, change in working capital, right? So try estimating that for a bank. What's capex for a bank? What's depreciation for a bank? What's working capital for a bank? For a bank, estimating cash flows is a nightmare. So what do people do? They throw up their hands eventually and say, I'm going to discount dividends. I'm going to argue. I, 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 I used to be one of those people. And I'm going to talk about why I've changed pathways on that one. But you can see why people stick with the dividend discount model. And the free cash flow equity model works. As long as the leverage is stable, you can pretty much use a free cash flow equity model. But as I said, this is more the exception to the rule. When, when you talk about most companies, it's tough to make a judgment on whether the leverage is stable. So I understand why firm valuation models kind of dominate, why you value the entire business. And get, remember, ultimately, if you do it right, you should get the same value for the equity. So this is a purely pragmatic choice. It's not which one will give me the better value. It's which one's easier to use. And a firm valuation model tends to be easier to use. Once you've decided what cash flow you're going to estimate for your firm, your discount rate kind of falls out of it, right? Because if your cash flows are cash flows to equity, you have to use cost of equity. If your cash flows to the firm, you have to use cost of capital. If your cash flows are in U.S. dollars, you discount. So in other words, you tell me how you estimate discount rates, uh, cash flows, I'll tell you how to estimate the discount rates. 
So whether they're real or nominal, whether they're dollar or euro, your cash flow estimation process should be the process by which you decide what discount rate is right for you. So what cash flow should I use? If you have stable, if you have stable leverage, you can probably use either free cash or equity or free cash for the firm. If you cannot estimate free ca cash flows at all, then go with the dividend discount model. If, in every other case, when you're uncertain about whether the leverage will change, go with the firm valuation. Which discount rate should I use? If your cash flows are cash flows to equity, go with cost of equity. If the cash flows the firm, go with the cost of capital. The currency, nominal, real, will depend on what you did with your cash flows. Now let's talk about growth patterns. If your company is a large company and it's growing at a rate close to or less than uh, or less than the growth rate of the economy, and it has all of the right characteristics of a mature company, a cost of capital typical of the average, it's reinvesting reasonable amount. In other words, behaving like a mature company, it's growing like a mature company, then treat it as a mature company. And what does that mean? You can probably value it right away with one step with the terminal value model. In other words, take the cash flow in year one, divide by arm, you're done. You could finish your entire intrinsic valuation with three numbers, expected cash flow next to you. Yeah. You think that sounds inadequate, but for a company like that, that's all you need. Don't go looking for trouble. If your firm is a large and growing firm, but it has room to continue growing, but not at you know, huge rates, you're talking about 6%, 5%, 7, there are pockets of growth left then use a two-stage model. What's a two-stage model? You put in a growth rate of eight, no, five or six or eight percent for the next five years, and then you bring them down to a mature growth rate. If your company is unstable, it's changing, it's shifting, its margins are changing, its growth rate is changing, then you have to open up the box. You can have a three-stage, four-stage. Every year can be a different stage model. So depending on your company, you might end up with the easy company in your group and do a mature, just a stable growth model, but do it only if your company fits the characteristic of a stable growth company. Or you might have to do 10 years of very different growth rates each year, very different margins. And it just reflects the fact that your company is shifting over time. So when I think about the building blocks of valuation, here's what I see. You choose a cash flow that can be either dividends, and if you want to augment it with buybacks, all the more power to you. It can be cash flows to equity, which is potential dividends, and I'm showing you the shortcut version of it. Or it can be cash flows to the firm, which are pre-debt cash flows. The cost of equity will be the discount rate you use. If you're looking at dividends or cash flow to equity, the cost of capital will be the discount rate you use to get to the value of the firm. What growth pattern use will be either that your company is already in stable growth, it has a period of high growth, but then it's going to, not, not even high growth, moderate growth and then stable growth, or the more general model where your growth rates can shift over time. And have, you probably, if you have a 30% growth rate for the next five years, you should probably arrange for a transition before you get to stable growth, because you're not going to go from 30 to 3 overnight. So what does a transition mean? Go from 30 to 3 in 5 steps. It's not a big deal, but at least you know, gradually shift your company down to a mature company. I think of discounted cash flow models like Lego boxes, right? We have Lego pieces that fit together. You've got the cash flow Lego box, the discount rate Lego box, the growth pattern Lego box. You put them together, you have a different model. If you try to fit the wrong pieces together, they won't go together. That's what happens when you take cost of equity and, ca and cash flow to the firm. So just be aware of the fact that you can create these infinite co number of combinations on models. Each one people like to claim is special and different, but they're all variations of the same thing. So let's summarize. When you think about the inputs that go into valuation, start, you know, go through it methodically. Start off by looking at discount rates, cash flows, growth rates, and, ter and, and the terminal value rules. Think about these different choices you have, and then think about what's right for your company. I mean, which means you can't open a spreadsheet and start entering numbers right away. It needs some background work. But that background work will stand you in good stead because it will save you a lot of time and a lot of headaches down the road. Thank you. And I will see you soon.